Well, good morning. I am so glad that you could join us again. I want to start out this morning by just saying thank you uh, for joining us. I know that in theory it should be easier to meet, uh, you know, online every week. You don't have to get out of your pajamas if you don't want. You can just roll out of bed. But I think in some ways it's actually harder to meet this way. There's so many things in your house. You're probably thinking I could be doing this or I could be outside enjoying the night's weather. So thank you for those of you who have been joining us on, on a regular basis for our worship services. I am so glad that you can be here and worshiping with us. And this has just been awesome to see our church uh, body connected and together and watching together, even though it's in a little bit different way than normal. So uh, thanks for coming in. I, I know I can't see you, but I am looking forward to the day, hopefully soon, where we can connect uh, in person and, and worship together. Second thing that I want to say before we get started is congratulations to our graduates, both in our church body and our community. We have a few, and so we just want to say uh, way to go. Um, our uh, graduates this year got ripped off a little bit. They, they don't get their usual um, ceremonies, and, and typically in church we'll have them come up and share a little bit uh, about what they um, about what they, they're doing and what they've done and, and where they've graduated from and what their plans are for the future. And so we're, we're not going to have them uh, come up and do that, but I just want to uh, tell you today that I would uh, love it. I would encourage you to call up a graduate or text them or their parents and just say, way to go. If it's their parents, you can say, way to go uh, as well. You made it. You did it. Um, and, and we're just so um, proud of them. So, so do that today. It, this is the weekend that would be graduation weekend for, for many of our students. And so um, just wanted to give them a little bit of a, a shout out. If you're looking for uh, the list of, of our graduates this year at Rose Hill, you can find that in the newsletter that we sent out this week. Uh, before we get started, I just want to remind you of a few resources that we have available. One is the worship songs. You should be able to find them in the info section of this video. Use those however you want today throughout the week to be, to be worshiping. Uh, our, our musicians have done a wonderful job uh, choosing those each week to go along with the, the message and the theme and what we're doing on a Sunday morning. Also, if you haven't signed up for a life group, I'm going to keep telling you that every week. Uh, there's no uh, time that's too late to jump in. You can go to rosehillefc.com slash groups to find that information. You can sign up that way. Uh, also, if you're not using the Right Now Media, uh, you, I would encourage you to, to do that. There are just some great resources. There's literally thousands of them to choose from. Some are short, uh, some are long, uh, some are series, some are one-time deals. Um, but you will find uh, a lot of resources there to be studying God's Word and growing during this time. Even though we haven't had Sunday school, we're not meeting together. There's so many resources there. So I would encourage you to use that. And then lastly, you can give um, at rosehillefc.com slash give, or you can text the word give to 605-205-8300. I want to thank all of you for your uh, giving during this during this time where, again, everything's a little, a little different than normal. But I'm glad we can worship, and we're going to jump in uh, to God's Word. We're actually going to start uh, a new series today. Uh, I've been hearing leaders and uh, other people lately using this term, reset. It kind of got my attention. You know, people are saying, hey, you know, we're, there's this crisis going on around our world, and at first people thought, hey, uh, I think, I think we're going to get back to normal soon. And what people started to realize is, hey, you know, things are never going to be exactly the same. It's not really a kind of a timeout from life. It's a, it's a reset. And so a lot of organizations, a lot of companies are starting to rethink, hey, how is life going to be different? And how are we going to change and adapt to what's coming? And I think that's true, not just for organizations and companies, but also for people. I think people are using this opportunity to, to maybe uh, take a look at how they're living their lives. We're already seeing that uh, as well. And I think it's a, it's a great time, not just uh, for anybody to think about the way that they're living, but I think it's a great time for Christians, particularly during this time, to stop and think, how am I living my life? Am I living my life in a way that's growing me to be more Christ-like and, and growing me in a way that's helping my witness as a Christian? And so those are some of the questions I want to, to ask. Because as, again, as a follower of Jesus, I think it's a perfect time to ask the, those questions. And, and if you're not a follower of Jesus, I think it's a perfect time to rethink that position as well. And, and this is why. 
you know, we're, we're seeing the, the sin in our world right now and we're seeing the brokenness of our world in a way that maybe we haven't before or haven't in a while. And, and I think that there's nothing that explains our present time as well as the gospel. See, the Bible tells us that we're living in a, a broken and fallen world. I think that's pretty apparent as disease and, and sickness are spreading around our globe. We're reminded of that. But, but hold on. There's a savior. God sent his son, Jesus, to save us and to promise something better. I think that Christian message is is so wonderful and we're seeing the truth of it today more than ever. So we're going to talk a little bit more about about Jesus and and his work today. But I want to encourage you uh, to think about this theme, Reset. And so we're starting uh, a series this morning. I'm calling it just that, Reset. And I want to be thinking about what it means to reset our life in particular areas. Uh, Three particular areas. They belong to what we call the spiritual disciplines. Spiritual disciplines or spiritual habits. Sometimes you hear that word discipline and you think of of negative connotations. But I want you to think of... um, I want you to think of spiritual disciplines in this way. I'm going to kind of define spiritual habits and spiritual disciplines so, we're kind of, uh, so we know we're talking about the same thing. So what are spiritual disciplines? First of all, they're activities. They're not attitudes that we have. Spiritual disciplines are things that we do. So for example, joy isn't really a, a spiritual discipline. We call that a fruit of the Spirit. It's an attitude that, that the Spirit works in our life. It's still incredibly important. The fruit of the Spirit are important. But it's different. A spiritual discipline is something that we do to put Jesus' words into practice. You know, Jesus told us that we're supposed to not just hear his words, but put them into practice. And he said that when we do that, we will be like a man who built his house on the rock. In other words, we'll be sturdy and we'll be firm. And spiritual disciplines are one of the ways that we do that. They're practices or they're habits. The second thing to know about spiritual disciplines is that they're modeled by Jesus. So they're activities and they're activities that we can see in the Bible, not just um, from anybody, but specifically in the life of Jesus. We see him carrying out these things in his own life. So you might be tempted to say something like, you know, for me a spiritual discipline is going out and working in my garden because it just it, it draws me close to God and I see the nature around him and, and that's great and that's great if God uses that in your life. But that's not necessarily a spiritual discipline as it's classically defined. A spiritual discipline is something that Jesus does. And so a perfect example of a spiritual discipline, and one that we're not going to talk about in this series because there's tons of them, but one is, is prayer. Prayer is a, a great spiritual discipline, and it's one that we see Jesus doing in his own life. And then the last thing to know about a spiritual discipline is a spiritual discipline is a means to an end. And that is to say it's not an end in and of itself. So what that means is that a spiritual discipline is something we do to get somewhere. It's not the place that we're going, if, if that makes sense. So we want to go somewhere and we use spiritual disciplines to get there. See, besides prayer, there's not many times, if ever, that a spiritual discipline is commanded in, in the Bible. Jesus never commands, for example, he never says, hey, read your Bible. We, we don't see that. That's not an end in and of itself. But it's something that helps us get there. And that end is to become more Christ-like. That's what God wants from all of us, is to become more and more like Christ Jesus. And one of the ways that we get there are through the spiritual disciplines. This is why some uh, compare it to working out. And I think that's a, a, not a perfect, but a pretty good example. Why do you work out? You work out because you want to get strength or a power beyond yourself. And so you work out, the, the, the working out isn't, isn't the end, it's, it's the means. I've never heard anyone say, man, I love working out because I just love when my muscles tear and I'm really uh, sore and I love that act of lifting that bar up or, or, or actually physically running. That's not why most people work out. The reason they do it is because they like how they look afterwards or they like how they feel or they like that they used to have pain and now they don't. Working out is a means to an end. And it's ways that we get power beyond ourselves. 
spiritual disciplines are like that. We're looking for a power. It's the power of Jesus, and we don't have it. And so we stick to these disciplines, these habits in our lives to, to build us up so that we can become more and more like Jesus Christ. See, the Christian's life is about Jesus. It's about having a relationship with him, having your sins wiped clean and that relationship with Jesus restored. That's what it's all about. That's the end. See, some people look at you know, things like scripture reading and go, man, I, I don't want to become a Christian because becoming a Christian, you have to read your Bible and go to church and you have to hang out with these people and, and they just see Christianity as a series of things that we do. But that's not what Christianity is. It's about a, a relationship with Jesus. The, the spiritual disciplines are, are just, you know, part of how we cultivate and, and build into that relationship. But that's not what it's all about. So if you're watching this again and you're not a follower of Jesus, that's what I want you to take away from this morning. That, that what this is all about is Jesus. He's offering you a relationship beyond your wildest dreams. He's holding it out to you and he wants you to accept it. And in a very real sense, what he offers you is a reset. It's a, it's a starting over. He wants you to start over. The Bible says he makes you new. He wipes away all the sins of your past so that you can have a restored relationship with him. The slate is clean. That's the good news of Jesus Christ or what we call the gospel. That we can be made new in him. If you are a follower of Jesus, then for the rest of this morning, I want to talk to you about a different kind of reset. It's a reset in your life. And so the idea is, during this time, and it, doesn't, it can be any time, it doesn't have to be during a time like this, but as we're, maybe life's, life's different right now, maybe for you, uh, life is slower than it's ever been, maybe it's, it's faster, I know everybody's situations are different. But let's stop and think about how we're living and how God wants us to live. And so we're going to talk about these uh, spiritual disciplines. We're going to do our, our first one today. If you have a Bible, I'd love for you to grab it. You can turn to the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 3. And while you're doing that, you're actually getting a head start on our first discipline today. Because our first discipline is God's Word. It's studying God's Word and opening up Scripture. And we're going to do that today and see what Scripture has to tell us uh, about Scripture and the importance of it. If you're not familiar uh, with it, with the Bible, there's, there's two books called Timothy, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. They're both, both uh, letters that were written by the Apostle Paul, and they were written to a pastor named Timothy. That's why it's called Timothy. And he wrote him at least two letters, but, but here's what we know about the relationship. Timothy was a young pastor, and Paul had mentored him. In fact, Timothy had traveled with Paul, we know, at, at least at a, a few occasions, and Later, what happened is Timothy settles down and he begins leading a, a group of Christians in a town, a, a church. And so Paul writes him these letters and he begins instructing him about how to live and how to be a leader and, and how to you know, preach and teach and, and pray for his congregation. And, and I love this book, and not just because I'm a pastor, but because we get to get, see a, a, a real insight into the Apostle Paul and how he spoke to Christians and what advice he gave them and what he found to be important. I think it's a really intimate letter and a really helpful one. And so we're going to jump into that letter uh, today again, 2 Timothy chapter 2, excuse me, chapter 3, and he's talking here about what it means to live a godly life. Don't, don't miss this part of it. And actually, if you look in verse 12, you'll see he uses that phrase, live a godly life in Christ Jesus. He contrasts them then to people who weren't living a godly life. And then, as he continues, he's talking about, remember, what it means to live a godly life. And then we have one of the most beautiful and important and memorable passages in Scripture about Scripture, if you can, if you can follow me. And it's this pa passage in 2 Timothy 3. So I want you to think about that. He's talking about a good life, and then he's going into Scripture. And don't miss what he's teaching you and I right there in that simple fact. And that is, to cultivate a godly life, you and I must absorb God's Word. That's what he's telling Timothy. He says, this is how you live a godly life. And then he's going to talk about the power of Scripture. If you and I want to cultivate a godly life, we must do the same thing. We must uh, absorb Scripture. 
Those words are intentional. That, that word absorb is, we'll talk about it a little, little later, how God wants us to soak up scripture and, and have it be a, a part of who we are, to be on our lips and, and on our minds at all times, as, as the Bible says. And then there's that word cultivate. Remember, a, a spiritual discipline is not an end, it's a means. And so the, the point of a, being a Christian isn't just to know scripture really well, although it's important. It cultivates that godly life. Studying scripture is a spiritual discipline. It's something that you and I do. So the point of studying scripture is not to say that you studied scripture. There's a a purpose beyond that. It's not an end, it's a means. So let's talk about the ends or what Paul says is the purpose. So we'll jump in together. Uh, Meet me in verse 14. We'll start here. Paul writes to Timothy and says, But as for you, Continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. A few things I want you to note in there. First, notice that he talks about the faith that uh, Timothy has known from infancy, he says. So from the time he was little, he knew the scriptures. Now, we know this from, from earlier in Timothy, but the man, Timothy, had a, a mom and a grandmother who were uh, Christians, and they were uh, very serious Christians, and so they taught Timothy at a young age to love Jesus and taught him about the word. And so he grew up with this Christian legacy in his own home. And so Paul here is uh, addressing this. He said, continue in what you have learned. And so that's the second thing I want you to pick up. Notice what he tells Timothy. Here's a guy who knew God's word. He he probably had a lot of it memorized. He, He was deep into it. And he says, continue. I think that's important. And it's a reminder that scripture isn't an ends. It's a means. Because he he could have told Timothy, hey, you did great. You did it. You know scripture. You've been learning it. Awesome. Way to go, man. You got there to the the finish line. But he doesn't because it's not the finish line. There's never too much scripture. He says, you're doing great, but continue because when you continue, you're going to get somewhere. So here's the ends. We're going to see two of them. The first is is that scripture makes you wise for salvation. Those are his exact words at the end of verse 15. The scriptures are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Here's what he means is that when you study scripture, you learn about salvation. You learn about Jesus who saves you. And we can't get to that truth unless we go through the scriptures. One translation puts this, uh, it says, it instructs you for salvation. Kind of explains uh, a little better what's going on here. That the Bible, when we read it, instructs us for salvation. Again, you're not saved by Scripture. You're saved by Jesus. Listen, reading your Bible is great, but if we read our Bible and we don't do what it says, as Jesus said, if you're a hearer but not a doer, it, it, it doesn't serve you any purpose. It doesn't do anything for you. But when you let Scripture speak to you and let God speak to you through it, it's going to point you to Jesus and you're going to meet your Savior through it. It's going to keep teaching us about salvation. And so that's the first ends is that Paul tells Timothy, be in Scripture, absorb the word so that you will be wise for salvation. And then he continues. And some of you can probably recite this, this next part. It's, it's well known to many Christians. Verse 16, he says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Notice that phrase there, it's God-breathed. There is a theology of scripture right there that's so important. It's telling us that scripture is inspired by God. That God didn't physically write it. He had human authors do that. But he was speaking through them, telling them in a way, through the Spirit, what to say. And so when we read scriptures, we are, in a very real sense, um, getting the the Word of God. That's why we call it the Word. God's speaking to us through human writers. And then he says it's useful. And he lists lists a, a bunch of tasks. 
right? It's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training. He begins listing pretty much every part of Timothy's ministry in one way or another. He's saying it's useful pretty much for everything. It reminds me of these infomercials that were on TV when I was a kid. You might remember them. It was for like a, a scissors that cut through anything. And over the course of this infomercial, they'd show you everything. It cut through. So they'd start with, you know, paper. It can cut through paper. Well, that's not very impressive. So here's a block of wood and it cut through a, a thin block of wood. And then I, I remember this. At the end, they cut through a penny. And even as a kid, I'd always wonder, like, why would you want to cut through a penny? Like, that seems like the dumbest thing you could do to cut up your money, but whatever. They're telling you, this is how strong it is. It can cut through anything. Paul's telling Timothy the same thing about God's word. Here's how powerful it is. You can use it for anything, for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting people, for training people in righteousness. That's just the life of God. He said it's, it's useful. There's a use to it. In other words, it does everything. And then notice that he continues there with a second end. It's a means to an end. And that end is it equips, equips you for God's work. It equips you for God's work. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. It just means uh, the work of God. And I know you might be tempted to think, maybe, that because he's talking to Timothy, this is for pastors, and the pastors are the only one who, who do good work or do the uh, work of God, but that's not true. As Christians, we all have work that's given to us by God, and Scripture is powerful and given to us so that we can do that work. What is some of the work that God's called you to? He's called you to be a parent, or an employee, or an evangelist. In a way, he's called us all to be evangelists. He's given you uh, the power through his word to do that work, and he gives us instruction through his word. He he wants us to be built up in that work and he equips you for every good work. Scripture is not lacking in any way. And when we go to scripture, we will find the guidance that we need in our lives. He says it's useful and it equips you for his work. And so what are we to do? We're called to absorb God's word. I I chose that word this week because I, I think of just soaking in scripture with our lives and I think that accurately describes what God wants from us. In fact, it's, it's loosely based on another uh, well-known passage about scripture in the Bible. Psalm chapter one, this is the first psalm in the Bible. David writes, blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord, who meditates on his law day and night. Law is just another way of saying God's word. That person is like a tree, don't miss this, planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Notice the the word picture, and I love this word picture. He said the person who's in God's word is like a tree planted by water. Now it's kind of saying what Jesus was saying when we, uh, you know, do uh, our hearers and doers then we're going to be on solid rock. He's saying you're like a tree planted by water. You're firm and you have everything that you need. It feeds you. It nourishes you. So there's this picture of just soaking in God's word, absorbing God's word. And he says if you do that, you will be blessed. The same thing Paul told Timothy. You'll be blessed in your life if you're in God's word because it helps cultivate that godly life. One of the most decorated uh, generals, soldiers of all time in American history, you've probably never heard his name, but Lieutenant General William K. Harrison was in the military during World War I. In fact, he was the most decorated soldier in the 30th Infantry Division. All you need to know about that is that uh, General Dwight Eisenhower once rated it as the number one division in World War II. So this was a a class of excellent soldiers, and and General Harrison was the most decorated officer in that division. Over the course of his time in the military, he earned every decoration except the Congressional Medal of Honor. He even had a a Purple Heart because he was uh, injured in battle, which was very rare in history for a general officer uh, to be wounded, and yet he was. He was incredibly decorated. And so during uh, the Korean War, Eisenhower actually picked General K. 
Harris, uh, General William K. Harrison as his man to go and negotiate uh, with the enemy, which ultimately led to the ending of that war. It was a, a huge task, and this was the man that he picked. And so I just want you to, to know here, he's a very uh, well-decorated man, a very hard-working man, a man who was very important and had very important tasks. But here's probably the most notable thing about his life. William K. Harrison was an intense man of God's word. When he was about 20 years old, he made a point in his life that every year he was going to read the Old Testament through once and the New Testament through four times. And so at a young age, he started doing that and he kept it up. All through his time in the military, as he rose through the ranks, as he became general, he did that every single year and he stayed on task. There were a few times where he might have missed a day or two, but he always made it up, including, I'm not making this up, at the Battle of the Bulge. When he was a part of that battle, when he got back, he caught up with his Bible reading. So at the end of the war, he was completely on schedule. This was a man who loved God's word. When he got older, he was losing his eyesight, and so he actually had people who every day would read him God's word, and he would keep that up. At the age of 90, get this, he had read the Old Testament 70 times and the New Testament 280 times through. Here's a man who loved God's word. And so there's three things that I want you to get from that story. The first is that it takes discipline to build up a life like that, but it pays off. When we get discipline early, and it's it's hard, habits are hard to build, it takes time, and yet it pays off in the end. The second thing I want you to see is that you're never too busy. Isn't it funny that we always say, well, I'm, I'm too busy or we think we have other more important things going on? I don't think any of us have ever been as busy as this man was. I think General Harrison probably was one of the busiest, man, uh, busiest men in the world at one point. And yet he always made time for God's word. And then the third thing I want you to pick up is that God's word changes your life. Friends of General Harrison and acquaintances and colleagues say that every area of his life was affected by Scripture. The decisions he made in the battlefield, the decisions he made in his life, the way he treated people, they were all informed by Scripture. When we soak up God's Word, it makes a difference in our life because just as Paul says, it cultivates a godly life inside of us. And so I want to come back to that idea of a, a reset I want you to be thinking about this. In this time of your life, do you need a scripture reset in your life? I I know it doesn't need to be now, just like it doesn't need to be New Year's to make a resolution. You can make a resolution anytime. But I think now is a good time. And if you're not in God's word, I'm gonna strongly, strongly encourage you. Be in God's word on a regular basis because the importance is right, right here. Paul tells us it cultivates a godly life. If you are not regularly soaking in God's word, make a point today. No, it doesn't save you. That doesn't mean it's not important. It's a key to a godly life. And so with that being said, what I want to do is I want to get into to three practices. If you haven't been with us the, the last few Sundays, In our last series at the end, I I finished with three practices, and I thought we'd continue uh, that through this series as as well. Here's what they are. These are just suggestions for you. I've been saying, and I'll say it again, you can take them or you can leave them. Uh, Some of them are things that I myself have found useful. Some of them are suggestions from others, including people uh, in this this church. You might already do some of them. You might not be, be interested. These are just to help you, and maybe they jog in your mind another way that you can be in God's Word. So I just want you to consider these three, especially if you're looking to do uh, a reset in your life and you don't currently, uh, aren't currently in God's Word on a regular basis. Here's a few things. First, you can read or you can use a, a reading plan, a Bible reading plan. You don't need a plan to read the Bible. You, you can just open up your Bible and begin reading. And yet there's something that's helpful. I think there's a huge benefit in having a plan, in having something that sets us out, uh, sets our, our Bible reading out. Yes, it keeps us focused, but it also makes sure that we're getting a wide swath of Scripture. See, a plan makes sure we're in different genres and different parts of the Bible, and there's a, a big importance to that. And it helps us build habits. Never take Never take lightly habits, they're powerful. 
Did you know when you do something that's a, a habit, so you get in the morning and maybe you go just pour a bowl of, of cereal and it's just a habit in your life, did you know your brain actually uses less energy doing that task? That's what a habit is. It's a shortcut uh, in your life. And so there's an importance to building these habits and it just it helps us keep us on track. And then we want to keep those habits up. I heard a story this week that happened, I think in the the 70s or 80s, there was a young comedian and he approached Jerry Seinfeld and he said, how do I, how do I turn out all this material? How do you do it? I, I don't even know how to start. And he gave him this advice. Jerry said, listen, go home and take your calendar and when you write new material on that day, take a pencil and draw an X on it. And every day you write new material, draw an X and what's gonna happen is it's gonna create a chain And once you get that chain going, you're not going to want to let that chain break. And so every day you're going to write new material and you just keep going. What he was teaching him was to build a habit. And there's something about that. This is where a a Bible reading plan can be incredibly helpful into building those habits and to keep it going. There's an importance in having uh, streaks. I will also say there's also importance to having grace when you miss a day or two. Maybe you're like me, and if you are, you kind of struggle with that. Oh my goodness, I I missed a day. But it's about having grace, but just making sure as often as we can, we can be in God's word. A a habit is something that should be uh, freeing and help us, not something that should feel uh, like bondage. There's a a bunch of good resources out there. If you're looking for something that reads through the Bible in in a year, I'd recommend uh, a couple. One is by Robert Murray McShane. You might have heard me a few weeks ago. I mentioned him. He was a Scottish pastor in the 1800s. He died at the age 30 uh, of 30, but he left some amazing resources. One of them, most famously, was this Bible reading plan. I've been using it for over a decade. I just love it. It goes through the Old Testament once every year, and then the Psalms and the New Testament twice. Um, it's just one that I've liked and gotten in the, in the rhythm of. There's also some excellent resources uh, that have been written that go along with it. Also, you can use the five-day Bible reading plan. This is one that we encourage in our church body. Many of you have have used that or are using that. You can just Google five-day Bible reading. Uh, They have a website. You can find that PDF. That's an excellent, uh, excellent resource as well. It doesn't have to be uh, going through the Bible in a year. The importance is just being in, you know, some, some scripture. And so, if you use an app like version, they often have uh, Bible reading plans. Some are short, some are based on a theme or topic, some are based in a, in a genre. Uh, the only advice I would give you if you do that is just make sure when you finish one up that you're switching it up a little bit, that you're in different parts of the Bible. Remember, Paul tells Timothy, all scripture is God-breathed and useful, even Leviticus. I know if you've ever read Leviticus, you're wondering, I'm not sure how this applies, but it actually it in some ways, it points to Jesus and his sacrifice and his coming. The point is that there is, is uh, an importance in being in all parts of Scripture. All Scripture is profitable. The second thing you could try is you could try a new translation. Try a new translation of the Bible, maybe one that you've never used before. Listen, despite what some people will tell you, there is no perfect transla- translation. There's just not. Language doesn't work that way. There's no perfect translation from one language to another. Different languages have different words and ideas and thought processes. And so when someone translates the Bible, and if it's a good translation, it's a team of translators. And what they're doing is they're trying to do their best to get to their goal. In other words, they're balancing between accuracy and readability. You got to balance those two things and each approach it different, but they're trying to get at the same thing. The, The best interpretation or the most useful interpretation of God's scripture. That doesn't mean there's, there's no way to get to God's truth. There absolutely is, but different uh, translations and do do it in, in little different ways. And so I think that it's helpful sometimes to switch up your Bible translation. This actually happened to me on accident. Several years ago, I wanted to, to learn more about a specific translation that someone had told me about, and so I started do, using it in my devotions. And the next year, I tried a different translation, and the next year, a different translation. And it's been, been so useful, I, I couldn't believe how many times I'd be reading something and say, I never noticed that before, or I never thought of it like that before. And it'd get me studying God's word deeper. When I study God's word now, it's a, it's a regular thing that I do to check other translations. 
I kind of think of it like looking at the same object from different directions. It can be helpful in, in doing that. And so if you're looking for a way to just switch up your, your time in God's word, I think that's an excellent thing uh, to try. Give a new translation a try. And then lastly, read Christian literature. This is an excellent way to dig deeper into the scriptures. Let's be honest. How many of you have read, or, or let's put it this way, when is the last time that you have read a Christian book? When's the last time you read a book? It might be a better question for some of you. Christian literature is important, and I'm not going to say as a replacement because it's not, but as an addition to another way to dig into God's Word. See, good Christian writing expounds, illuminates, and explains Scripture. And so I think there's a use for that. There are men and women who have been down the same path that we're going down, and, and who better to show us the way, to warn us of, of dangers or, or to help us through those tough times. And so that's, in a way, what Christian literature does. And so I think that it's important to, to do this, to be in books written by, by good, godly uh, authors. The sad truth is not many Christians, especially evangelical Christians, read many books especially men. So if you're listening to this and you're uh, a male, if you're watching this, I'm talking specifically to you. Did you know that only 25% of all Christian books are purchased by men? I think among men especially, we're not reading enough literature and we're not getting that, that uh, exposition of God's word that it offers. I've just learned that leaders and uh, people that I look up to in my life are readers. I, I have this phrase, many of you have probably heard me say this, leaders are readers. And that's something that I've just, I've just seen. I love um, the Gospel Coalition posts these articles where they'll have a well-known Christian leader and they'll just ask them what they're reading and they just talk about their nightstand. It probably sounds like the most boring thing in the world. I love it because it helps show me other, other books and other, other resources and it proves my point. Leaders are readers. And again, I'm not just talking to pastors uh, and leaders like Timothy. All of us are leaders in different realms. And so it's important to be reading. Where is it that you lead? You lead a family? You lead employees? You lead a class? You lead a community? Reading is important and helpful, especially when it points us to Scripture and illuminates Scripture. So make reading a priority. Maybe you already... Again, if you're like me and you have a stack of books on your nightstand, maybe you have uh, plenty of reading, you can ask someone for a recommendation. Maybe it's a, a devotional, but, but find a, a book that you can dig into. And, you know, I'm a little leery during this series, especially with the practices of just giving you more things to do. And so a helpful way to do that is just to find something you're already doing to either add to or replace in your life. And, and so I'll just say this, if you're someone who maybe you you spend a little time on your smartphone, like before you go to bed and you're reading, you just don't think of it like that. You're, you know, on Facebook or social media or you're reading articles people posted. Maybe put that phone down, if I could encourage you to do that, and pick up a book instead. You know, it'll, it'll not only make you uh, spiritually wiser, I think, but it will also help you sleep better, especially if it's not on your phone because your, your phone actually has a, a blue light and it, it has been shown to have an effect on your sleep. So maybe pick up a, a book. A lot of us have the time. We think we don't have the time, and yet we really do. And just like the story of, of General Harrison shows us, you know, Scripture should be a priority. And we all have time for Scripture because it helps us cultivate a godly life. So there are your three practices this week. You can take them uh, or you can leave them. Again, they're just suggestions. I'm not here just to give you more stuff to do. And in the end, remember that Scripture isn't the ends, but it is the means. And it does help us get to that goal. What we're called to do is to live like Jesus. And all through the series, that's what we're going to focus on. Becoming more like Jesus. Becoming more Christ-like. And for that reason, we must absorb as much Scripture as we can. When you absorb God's Word, you cultivate a godly life. Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you uh, for your word. I know I say that often after we dig into it, but especially this morning, I am so thankful for your word that you speak to us. Your word says that scripture is living and active, 
the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. You speak to our lives. And Lord, if I firmly believe that if we're going through this life and we're trying to tackle our challenges, but if we're not in your word, we're disconnected from the way that you're trying to give us wisdom and the way that you're trying to speak. It's almost like we have earmuffs on. And so I just pray for all of us that you'll help us to, to cultivate uh, some of these spiritual habits and these disciplines. I know there's many uh, who are watching this who have that discipline built into their life. I want to praise you for that. I want uh, to pray for the strength for them to continue in it, as Paul told Timothy. And for those who, who have not yet done that, I, I pray that you would uh, give them the strength and, and help them to build those habits. If there's anyone here watching who does not know you, Lord, I pray that they would know first and foremost that what you offer us is a relationship with your son. And there's nothing better than that. That's the true ends. That's what you want for us is to know Jesus and become more like him. And so we thank you again and pray these things in the name of your son. Amen. I want to thank you again for, for tuning in. If you're in a life group, I'll, I'll see you in a, a little bit. I hope to see all of you in our church family before long. But, but thanks again uh, for joining us and, and have a great week.